Okay, my friends, this is pretty serious today. Um, this is Roger, um, Mud Foster University. I know there's a lot of people I've been hearing from that are suffering from a lot of different things, a lot of different diseases, and it ends up being a lot of cancers. And why do cancers strike almost anywhere in your body? It, it attacks your organs, your skin, um, everything. Your, your, all, all your body is is a bunch of different zones that are separated from the rest of the world. If they're not separated from the rest of the, rest of the world, that zone becomes invaded. Now, what separates your zones from the rest of the world? It's mucous membranes. It's these little tiny thin layers coated with mucus. And where does the mucus come from? It comes from bacteria. Where does the bacteria come from? It lives inside of you. It lives right in those sheets. Those sheets are, are saturated with bacteria. And what does the bacteria do? It says, whoa, there's something coming here. And it clicks and it starts making goo. And that goo lines your gut and your everything in your body, every cell has the ability to ward things off with this mucus goo. When you kill the bacteria that creates the goo, you are invaded. So what happens? You, you, the, the, the molecules that are in your body that say, I'm an aggressive molecule, I'm a killer. I go in and I break things down and I kill things and I destroy and I'm a toxic substance but i need to be in your body because that's what your body does it does all kinds of toxic things there is so much toxicity in you you're like a toxic waste dump but it's separated it kept it's kept away from your vital flesh now this guy is is well let's just see who he is all right this is um a video it's just called how to stay healthy until you're 105 it's in your gut dr stephen gundry on health theory now listen to this this is going to going to set you off i'm going to tell you right now because if you don't pay attention to your bacteria in your gut you're going to be sick you're going to be unhealthy you're going to be tired you're going to be chronically ill you're going to have all kinds of conditions that nobody is going to be able to take care of because it's inside of you and you cannot get past this problem without taking care of this bacteria. Everybody, welcome to Health Theory. Today's episode is round two with the extraordinary Dr. Stephen Gundry. He's a New York Times best-selling author of The Plant Paradox and most recently The Longevity Paradox. He's also an award-winning renowned heart surgeon and researcher as well as the former president of the American Heart Association. But the crazy part of his story is that he left the profession he built his entire career around at the height of his success when he realized he was just dealing with symptoms and not addressing the underlying causes of those symptoms. All right, let's find out what those causes are. All right, what you're going to need to do is go up and see this video yourself. It's called How to Stay Healthy Until You're 105. It's in your gut. Dr. Stephen Gundry on Health Theory. And um, it is put out by Tom Bilyeu, B-I-L-Y-E-U. This is May 9th, 2019. This is very recent information, and this guy is fabulous. So I am going to just highlight a few of the things that he says because we're going to talk about autism very quickly, heart disease, and um, just the devastating chronic illnesses that happen because the bacteria is destroyed. And he, will, he goes through this in extreme, elegant detail in, in laymanly terms. And he is so deeply involved in this, so intimately involved in transplanting hearts and working with all of this for 50 years and when you hear how he treated the internal problem that people were dying from and within three days they were back to 100 percent health otherwise they might have easily died and all it was was a poop enema so wait till you hear the truth of the story all right, I'm just going to start here. Listen. 
Yeah. So it's kind of a double whammy. This is so interesting to me. It's crazy. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover here. So one, I want to talk about fecal uh, microbial transplants, which are really interesting. So I think we have sort of a really basic understanding. Um, your book goes into a lot of detail, so people should definitely check it out because it's so interesting the more that I understand this stuff. Um, but we have a basic understanding so far in the time that we've had together today. Now, how can fecal microbial transplant help with that? Why does that work? And why didn't it get widespread adoption? All right. First of all, I want to make a couple quick statements to be for you to think about as this is going through. This goes back uh, like 50 years ago that they were doing this research, and it was dismissed. Um, secondly, um, just pay attention to to the fact that bacteria. You have, right now, they, they had a thousand bacteria, and now they just found another thousand, or they had 10,000, now they found another thousand within the last month or so. There's 11,000 bacteria that live inside of you. Why do you have that many bacteria? They're not part of you. They do things for you. Some of them af affect you negatively, yes, but all of the rest of them are there to benefit you and to produce products for your immune system and for enzymes and to transition metals and to break things down and to pick things up they are there for your health all right so just listen so back in the 70s when broad spectrum antibiotics came out they they were truly miracle drugs because before that we had to uh, actually culture a bacteria find out what antibiotic it was sensitive to and then give that antibiotic you know and that would take, oh gosh, 48, 72 hours to do. When broad spectrum antibiotics were invented, it was, you know, it was a shotgun approach. N no worry, we don't, even know, we don't have to know what you have. Uh, here, take this, we're going to wipe out everything. Which was great in a lot of ways. But what we didn't know was that we also wiped out every last living bacteria, for the most part, in our gut. And we were so naive back then that we didn't realize that that microbiome was incredibly important. And so we dealt a lot of people all of a sudden with what was then called pseudomembranous enterocolitis. It's now called C. difficile, uh, Clostridium difficile. And all that means is the, the membranes are breaking down. And so these guys got horrible infections in the lining of their gut. Nobody had any treatment for it. These people were dying in hospitals after getting broad-spectrum antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And we're going, what the heck? So uh, my one of my mentors, who is the chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Um, now, before I continue, remember he just said they were dying, and they still are. Said, you know, this has got to be, we've wiped out most of the bacteria in the gut, and... This is an ecosystem where there are checks and balances. So all of a sudden now we've wiped out most of the checks and balances and there's probably a rogue bacteria Can't that's either. taken over. It's party time. You know, so clever. Party time. So he says, we gotta get, you know, good stuff back. And he said, where are we gonna get that? And he starts looking around at the medical students. True story. And he said, you know, medical students, they're pretty healthy. So once a week, this is the mid 1970s, they would pass around this plastic bucket. It was called the honey pot, and we'd take it into the john and take a crap. You know, you actually had to hold it. You know, get get to school and you know take a crap. And he'd take it to his lab, and I'll never forget we had wearing blenders. You know, and homogenize all of this medical student poop and put it in enema bags and give these people fecal enemas. This is in the 70s. And he would have before and after pictures and he'd go to meetings and show, you know, this horrible inflammation, this horrible infection in the colon. And then a week later, it's pristine, it's beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. people are singing kumbaya inside the colon. And, and everybody goes, oh, he's making this stuff up. That can't happen. And so people did not believe it because we had no idea. No one had, had sequenced the human microbiome. Mm -hmm. 
That was really only five years ago. Well, now, since the sequencing of the human microbiome, it's, you know, you go, well, of course, you know, there were 10,000 different species of bacteria in, in you and me. And right. In fact, a month ago, they found another thousand. And normally, there are beautiful checks and balances. But it's when these checks and balances get disturbed by taking a round of antibiotics or as simply as eating meat where the chicken or the pork or the beef was given antibiotics. All right. I just want to make a couple other statements about the specific types of diseases that we're seeing now and what I think there may be some correlation to. It should be looked into. I'm not saying how to treat yourself and how to run your life, but I'm saying these are things that make sense to me that we should look into. All right, this is about autism. Now, people are claiming, oh, they're getting it from vaccines, this and that. Well, let's discuss this whole thing rationally, understanding that these kids have to have barriers against these invasive things that they're shooting into them that if they have the barriers already are destroyed they will become you know infected basically they're, they they don't have any immune system to fight against these antagonists they're they're putting in their body to to say hey let's go get your immune guys to fight against this well i don't have any immune guys well you're in big trouble my friend and then the next thing you do you know in younger kids their neurological system is exploding like an atomic bomb it just is shooting out neurons like machine gun bullets now if you upset that in the midst of its construction, now you have a serious issue. I think I could be wrong, but I believe, and he, he's going to discuss it. And the same thing goes with the neuro, uh, neural issues with uh, all, all the different Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all the motor neuron uh, movement diseases are also affected by these membranes. Everything has to be isolated. And if it's not isolated, it gets shorted out and you get different spasms, all kinds of things happen. So here it goes. I don't need one. I'm like, make sure that you smear the baby in the vaginal fluid at a minimum. And people are always like, whoa. But just trying to pass that microbiome on, and you said there was a recent study that came out about autism and fecal microbial transplants and how the link between a, a successful, maybe the wrong word, microbiome and an unsuccessful one can manifest as autism. Talk to me about that study. Yeah, there's, um, we've known for actually a long time since the microbiome was identified and sequenced. That we know All right, now this is the same thing we've known for a long time. This guy had to, I don't know if he had to leave his profession, but he did. He was a president of the Heart Association. He's a big shot. And he just walked away because he realized he's just pretty much hurting people. He wasn't doing what he had to do to fix them. I know that, number one, kids with autism have a lot more irritable bowel, and they have a lot more GI issues, and they actually have a very different microbiome than, quote, normal. And there has been a suggestion. That's the other issue I have is there is no normal database. Nobody knows what the bacteria are supposed to be in everybody yet. He's saying they're finding a thousand in the last month or something. They, they don't even know. They don't know what transition metals are you and what quantities. They don't know what kind of enzymes are you and what quantities. What are they doing? Suggestion for years that maybe it is that microbiome that is suggested for years. They cause. Mm. Autism. There's even more exciting work in gynecology and obstetrics that the, there is a microbiome in the vagina that we know about, but there is a microbiome of the placenta itself. And there's some actually exciting work that perhaps the microbiome of the placenta is the most important in terms of educating the 
neonate, the fetus is immune system. Do you only encounter that as um, you're actually born and you go through no, it? No, right. during So the whole time you're washing it. During. Then why would a C-section be so problematic? Well, so one of the theories of autism is that this is an in utero problem that happened to the kid before he was born or she was born. The reasons I say he is that boys have it far more than girls. Now, that was another thing that I found very interesting. He, because autism strikes boys much more than girls. There's got to be a reason there. It's got to have something to do with the hormones, I'm sure. And that now there is interesting evidence that we should be working on the maternal microbiome during, before pregnancy, and certainly during pregnancy. We need to start early in making sure the microbiome is right. So, getting back to autism. You know, it just, it just struck me just now. You know, this could be a, a, another problem with gender identity. Who knows? Who really knows? There was a recent study just published, and don't quote me on the exact details, but it comes out of Australia. And because of this connection, with autistic kids having funny bowels and a funny microbiome. They, with an institutional review board permission, did oral fecal transplants in a large number of autistic kids. Oral fecal transplants means they just literally ate it. And they did this for about six weeks. Almost immediately, 50% of the autism symptoms subsided, 50 percent. And the paper has now followed these kids for two years, and the 50 percent reduction in symptoms has continued. Wow. And if that does make the case that you know the gut and the microbiome has such an incredible effect on the brain. I don't know what does. This guy is absolutely fabulous. You have to watch this. Now, I'm going to leave it at that. But I have a whole batch of videos on this as well. But he really breaks it down and presents the evidence that should be accepted. It should be accepted by anybody. Because this guy really is, is an authority. I'm just a guy that did a bunch of research. That I, I took the research of everybody that's doing research. And I just consolidated it, and I said, yeah, this all makes sense. He did the same thing. It's, it all makes sense. But he's got some moral authority or some, you know, scholastic authority or whatever, medical authority to speak on it. I don't. So take his advice, but take some advice that will help you on this. Because I see this now because I have so many people in the groups, and they've seen that I've taken an interest in this. I'm seeing there's nobody that's not affected. There's nobody that's not affected by this anymore. Just watch this. That's all I can say.